Strike a match. What you witness is a flux of energy, that is, of energy changing form as it passes through and interacts with physical matter. Nothing, absolutely nothing, ever happens in the reality we inhabit except as a flux of energy. From burning matches to planets orbiting their suns, to plants growing or winds blowing, engines humming or electricity flowing, to the very thoughts in your head as you experience this video, thoughts embodied as electrochemical activity in the neurons in your brain. All are examples of energy passing through and interacting with physical matter and changing form as it does so. It is shocking, really, that so fundamental a feature of the world should have been so poorly understood for so long. It was only a little over a century ago that the nature of energy was properly discerned. This is fundamental to our topic, the collapse of modern civilization, because this civilization, more than any before it, is characterized by massive energy flows and mind-blowing complexity. We can scarcely hope to understand this civilization or its ongoing collapse unless we have a basic understanding both of energy and of complexity. We'll introduce the discussion of energy in this video and cover the basics of complexity in the next one. The big breakthrough in our understanding of energy, historically, was the realization that energy can never be created, and it can never be destroyed. But it can take on many different forms, and it can change from one form to another. The burning match shows chemical energy changing into other kinds of energy, including light and heat, and the mechanical movement of the warmed air and smoke that rise and swirl. Energy needn't be in motion. Until it is struck, the energy released in the flame and heat of the match was statically embodied in its head, specifically in the chemical bonds in the molecules that make up the ignitable material. Transformations of energy from one form to another are the root of all life. On Earth, radiation from the sun in the form of light is captured by plants. With that energy and out of the raw materials of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, the plants make complex molecules, such as carbohydrates and proteins, that embody what used to be radiant energy as chemical energy. That's the miracle commonly called photosynthesis. Other organisms consume the plants, or their products, and release the chemical energy contained in them to power their own bodies, to grow and reproduce. Every organism needs an energy capture strategy in order to exist, and in order to continue to exist. We're all made of matter, and without energy flowing through it, matter is dead. Dead not only in the sense of being lifeless, but in the sense of being inert and unmoving. The fact that energy cannot be made or unmade but only transformed is part of what is called the first law of thermodynamics, a fancy word for how energy gets about. But there is a second part that is equally important. When there is an energy flux, that is, when energy is expressed through physical matter, the matter always has some kind of work done on it. This can be as simple as warming it or moving it, but also perhaps breaking it or melting it or rearranging it in some way or changing its chemical composition. But there is never a flux of energy through matter that doesn't cause some sort of work to be done on the matter itself. Energy can't be made or unmade, but when it's expressed through a system, the system changes. That's the first law. The next breakthrough in our understanding of energy is what is called the second law of thermodynamics. Its implications truly are enormous, especially when it comes to the collapse of industrial civilization. To illustrate the second law, suppose that you have a well-insulated box, and that inside it you put two containers, one full of very hot water and the other full of very cold water. You shut the lid and wait. Of course, we all know what we will find when we open the box a few hours later. We'll find two containers of water, each of them equally tepid, neither hot nor cold. 
We also know, at least intuitively, that this never happens in reverse. We will never put two jars of lukewarm water in a box and discover hours later that all the warmth has spontaneously moved into one of them, leaving it hot and the other cold. Never happen. That, in a nutshell, is the second law of thermodynamics. In the original situation, one hot and one cold, we have what is called an energy gradient, a region with more energy adjacent to a region with less energy. The second law just says that energy will always look for a way to pass from the energetically dense region to the energetically less dense region, and energy will never spontaneously move from a less dense to a more dense region. A close analogy is the behavior of water. Water will always flow downhill if it can, until it finds its lowest point. By itself, we never see water flow uphill. A question arises. What is that lowest point for energy? The answer turns out to be diffuse heat, or, more specifically, thermal equilibrium. Energy is always seeking to move from more energy-dense regions to less energy-dense regions, and when it no longer has any potential to do so, it is because it has reached a condition where no energy gradient exists. That is thermal equilibrium. Now, let's put these laws together. The second law tells us that in the presence of an energy gradient, the energy wants to find expression and thereby eliminate the gradient in favor of thermal equilibrium. And the first law tells us that in doing so it performs work, that is, it changes things in some way. But together they also tell us that without an energy gradient, energy will not move, and therefore no work can be performed. Thermal equilibrium is in this sense just a way of saying, ain't nothing gonna happen. There are two words that are very useful in this context. The amount of work that the energy in a system can perform, because there exists an energy gradient, is referred to as the exergy of the system. You can think of exergy as a kind of shorthand for useful energy. The other word is entropy. This concept is abstract and often defined in different ways, depending on the context. For our purposes, it is perhaps most useful to think of it as being a sort of opposite or inverse to exergy, in the sense that the more exergy a system has, the less entropy it has, and vice versa. The first and second laws show that in any isolated system the exergy can only decrease, and the entropy can only increase. Put another way, whenever any work is performed by a system, the total amount of work it can do subsequently must decline. When it reaches maximum entropy, as it must eventually, and all the exergy is gone, nothing more can happen. Unless, of course, you add more energy to it. But that energy must come from somewhere. So then you're just considering a larger system, and for that larger system, the laws of thermodynamics still hold. This means that you can actually decrease entropy and increase exergy, but only locally, and only at the cost of decreased exergy and increased entropy globally. The laws of thermodynamics have been proven by experiment over and over again, but the best evidence for them is their enormous explanatory power when it comes to understanding why the world works the way it does. No thoughtful person can really doubt them. And so most people understand that there's no such thing as free energy or a perpetual motion machine. Nonetheless, our popular media is filled with stories that betray a serious lack of understanding of these laws. Here's a particularly glaring example. Someone has connected an alternator to the axle of a Chevy Bolt to recharge the battery while it goes down the road. Trouble is, the Bolt is an EV, an electric vehicle, and so it runs off the battery to begin with. Consequently, this setup doesn't make the vehicle more efficient, but less so, because the alternator consumes some of the energy being supplied by the battery to the wheels in order to spin to generate electricity. Since it can never be 100% efficient, it can't possibly return to the system even as much energy as it consumes, 
much less return enough more to charge the battery that it is also draining. To do so, it would have to somehow create energy, which the first law forbids. Other examples aren't so obvious. Some that we will spend considerable time unpacking are the so-called renewable energy technologies. The media and many promoters, knowingly or unknowingly, present solar and wind-powered systems as though they were themselves renewable, when in fact it is only the energy that is renewable, and that only because the sun is providing a constant stream of radiant energy from outside the planetary system. The electronics, concrete, metal, and other materials that these systems are made of are not in any sense renewable, nor is the fossil fuel that is needed to manufacture, transport, and maintain them. There's no escaping the laws of thermodynamics. The fact is, the entire universe is just kind of running down all the time, like a wind-up clock inexorably marching towards that moment when there's no more oomph left in the spring, and the hands stand still. But not to worry. At only 14 billion years or so old, the universe is still practically a baby. Its old age is so far in the future as to be impossible even to imagine. Our interest is in the present and future course of a civilization that requires mind-numbingly vast amounts of energy just to maintain its own status quo. To pursue that interest, we shall next turn our attention to the real fruit of the work that exergy does. Complexity. As always, thank you for watching.